Thank you very much. Uh, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ugo, Thank for, you, uh, for presenting that to us. I'm already starting to have a lot of uh, questions popping up, but I'll leave those for after everybody's introductions. Um, next up, we have Orly. Uh, Orly Bayad is a French-born visual uh, artist based in Antwerp, Belgium. Um, her work examines the relationship between human individuals and the online sphere uh, using video photography and performance uh, to confront us with the messy and dirty thoughts and desires of our hyper-real identities. Her latest work, Crush Machine, uh, is a multi-channel video and installation which talks about the difficulties that one has with connecting with others because of the too much internet, the too much connectedness that the online space brings. So, Orly, I'm excited to hear uh, more about it. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, yeah, I'm a visual artist, very fascinated by the digital and online uh, presence. I'm very, um, I base my work around self presentation and how does one can um, uh, create a persona online and how can you create a narrative around an uh, image that you post. Uh, I'm very interested about. Um, especially social media and how uh, people are um, yeah, experiencing things and how we are all um, yeah, trying to talk about uh, stuff and how, how we are all trying to uh, create special narratives and how we are all talking about special things. <laughs> Sorry, this is a bit... Uh, yeah, no, I'm just... Maybe I should just talk about uh, my video crush machine. Um, so it, it was a work that I made uh, this year. Uh, I was doing a master at, uh, in uh, Ghent, and it was all about, um, because it was a bit about the aftermath of uh, the COVID and how we are all experiencing uh, having to be online and having to share things online and um, having to create and 
how do we connect with people, but uh, also this idea that um, the online sphere is the only thing that we can use to connect with people. There is no more this idea of touch and this idea of uh, materiality. So it's um, like you have to, you have to be online and you have to connect. But um, how do you connect when you also want to be in the real life? And um, this is just uh, not something that is possible. So it talks a lot about yeah, this idea of touch and this idea, uh, but maybe I can just uh, show, show you. Yeah, I can just, this is um, a very short um, extract of um, this video. So this is just the intro. You can see me. <laughs> so this is just uh, an introduction of the video, which is like 10 minutes, and it's all about. Um, so yeah, this idea that you're stuck online and that you're um, having this panic attack. So this is um, someone who is, um, yeah, which is having in a dialogue with themselves about um, how to get better and how to go. Uh, through this panic attack, and so it's, there is uh, several voices. Uh, one that is very alluring and very um, in this idea of seduction and this idea of like come and I will save you, come and I will make everything okay. But it's not forcefully um, the best voice. It's a bit of this idea of a bit of cult in a way of like trying to make you believe that what they are saying is the best, but it's also not for Sweet the best, and then this other voices, which is maybe a bit more harsh, and was also trying to uh, trying to force another reality, but it's not for Sweet the best neither, but it's just uh, another way. And also this, this video is a loop, so it's also this idea that um, like it comes and go, and it's uh, it's a continual. And okay, there is uh, moments where you will uh, get up and get out of this. Um, mood, but it's also coming back. And yeah, it's, I make a lot of uh, self-portraits. Uh, and this was another work, uh, which is uh, what do you do when you're not online? And I did this work during uh, Corona, and I was stuck in a residency in Antwerp. And um, well, not, this was a bit later, because there was someone else. <laughs> Um, and um, it's about this idea of uh, yeah, what do you do when you're not online and when you have no choice than uh, being alone. But also, um, it's a bit of contradictory text because it's actually what you do when you are online. And um, 
this idea that you cannot uh, escape uh, the online space and that um, when you are not online, actually, do you exist uh, or what, what, what do you become? Because there is a bit this, um, this idea that um, now everything is ruled with the online uh, sphere and um, if you're not online, that you are not nobody. You cannot exchange with your friend, you cannot know where to go for events or uh, where like, you get all your sources of information uh, online. So it's also this idea. And, yeah. and it's also like you cannot uh, get a feeling of touch when you're online. So how do you make this? <laughs> yes, this is me. Thank you, Orly, for uh, sharing that with us. I felt like I wanted to touch that video myself, so <laughs> there's so many different tactile elements and goo and things that uh, look very appealing but also very frightening, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we also have, as you know, uh, this is a hybrid event, of course, so we have some uh, panelists joining us, some artists joining us via Zoom. Uh, maybe we could bring them up on the screen if that's possible. Hello. Uh, so this here is uh, Bogomir Doringer. Thank you for joining us. So nice to see your face. Uh, Bogomir is a Serbian-Dutch artist, a researcher, and curator. Uh, Bogomir is curator and head of education and re research at NXT Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, he's also currently doing an artistic research PhD at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna with the ongoing research project, I Dance Alone, that observes clubbing from a bird's eye view and as a mirror or reaction to social and political changes. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about this and, uh, and the other work that you would like to bring into discussion here. Sure, great. Just to check if everybody can hear me, um, I actually um, I uh, unexpectedly end up in Belgrade, where I'm from. So sorry that I'm not with you. Um, I will also share my screen. Um, it was kind of a difficult uh, assignment for me because um, um, two large researches that I've been doing for last almost 15 years, uh, even actually longer, are somehow leading us to the discussion that we're having today. They are leading us to this relationship between body and technology, uh, thinking how online spaces could become a new form of a free space, uh, a space where we can practice collectivity, togetherness, otherness, experiment, artistic creation, but also create safe spaces for different communities. So I thought to start from a um, very early project and introduce you actually ritual of masking and dancing as a kind of um, idea to also understand these online spaces in a, in, a, in a certain way. So when I talk about ritual of masking, I'm interested in talking topic of facelessness in contemporary society. So for many years, I've been researching um, artworks where faces are not presented. Um, and particularly, I was interested in uh, artworks um, after 9-11. The reason for that was that there was this kind of huge, massive production of artworks where faces are not shown. Um, but I would also like to show you this image of unknown photographer where portrait of uh, the, it's called Portrait of Free Women. It's apparently from 19th century and it's interesting that these the women do not want to show the face in front of camera because camera is seen, technology is seen as this kind of unwanted uh, almost presence that will take their soul from them. And um, precisely that is exactly what actually Faceless was addressing. It was addressing the times in a post 9-11 uh, society where um, this sort of idea and separation between those who show the face and those who do not show the face, those who can participate or not. We're talking about um, um, uh, Twin Towers, X uh, incident, um, terrorist attack. 
we're talking about the implementation of surveillance. So we're talking about this impact of technology on our body. And um, this is just one of the groups of artists that I managed together with this project. And it's sort of ongoing because, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you're noticing a lot of faceless images. And even if we think about face filters, it is a form of a ritual of masking. So for me, it was interesting to look how event like 9-11 and the same way as COVID-19 impacts our bodies and in which way technology is used in these situations. So how the implementation of uh, fake or non-fake working or not working, um, a low resolution or high resolution surveillance uh, impacted our uh, way of behaving, the way we move, the way we act in public space, how proper we are, how uh, carefully we walk, how normal we appear, and how uh, the topic of Burka, um, you know, attack on Tel von Hoch in Amsterdam in 2004 uh, started becoming a fashion of a facelessness. Um, the images are pretty much chronologically organized, sometimes not, but I will explain for what reason they're not. So we're looking into this kind of uh, media distributed image of facelessness that became a perversion where we have at the same time, you know, Taliban's and we have at the same time Kanye West wearing a mask to come to the time where, yes, uh, Kardashian, Kim Kardashian came to the Meta Gala event faceless too. So we live in contemporary times, in contemporary times of facelessness. Any public protest that happened in the last 20 years, Zapatista, Anonymous, Pussy Riots, was under some kind of face cover, or even Million Hoodies March was under the hoodie. Uh, Black Lives Matter that happened in times of COVID under the mask too. And then Hong Kong protest, the mask was necessity because the only way for these people to take public space was by these kind of alter egos that happened under the mask. Um, and at the same time, the only way for them to escape the face detection was with these kind of tricks that artists around the 2010 were uh, experimenting and proposing. Like Adam Harvey was, for example, obsessed with this idea of a counter surveillance and how the way we are dressed and makeup can help us to escape uh, technology. Um, or like how the research of Zach Blas is uh, trying, the technology that is trying to detect our sexuality can be escaped with the use of masks. And what is very important on the topic that we are speaking today is how digital filters, how digital masks, how uh, face filters were introduced as a kind of layer between us and camera, which actually allows us to mask ourselves, to transform ourselves uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of technological uh, uh, environment. So now, yes, we are all pretty much constantly trying out all these different face filter beautification. And uh, it, this practice is for me very similar to what we used to do in clubs or in nightlife. We're actually now doing on our own uh, with the phone uh, and the camera. And um, besides that, we're also learning that face detection and technology does not include us all. So that, for example, when it comes to face detection, uh, certain skin colors, uh, darker skin colors is not uh, recognized. So uh, the consequences and the impact that this technology has, particularly in states on African-American community, are quite Hi. So this question of is technology inclusive or does it see me uh, is also something that uh, is pretty much addressed in the times we live now. So this is the work from Joy Bellavini, who actually managed to attack these different companies that produce face detection and ask them to improve or stop using it before it's um, uh, working properly. And then on the other side, I was uh, researching the ritual of dancing. So I'm interested in dance because it's a nonverbal communication. It's an artistic form. It's a form of a socializing. Um, it's something that we do even before we start speaking. But still, we never really analyze what happens in a clubs, in a nightlife, and what these uh, non-professional dancers are communicating. So what are they expressing? What are they moving for? Do they move for or not? So I've been following dance floors uh, for many years and filming 
playing them and I was interested to understand what rituals, what dances are happening there. Are they performative, participatory? What are the functions? Uh, are they social, erotic, sacred, liturgical, competitive, martial, political? Uh, which is often missing because governments like to actually delete this possibility that the dancing body is a political body as well. And by filming cameras for many years, I started recognizing the change in movements, the change in gesture, uh, and getting return, uh, actually having a more and more political discussions around the dance floor. So who is welcome, who is not, who participates, who not, are these spaces safe or not? What is the ritual for? Is it for empowerment of female community? Is it uh, in, for empowerment of LGBTQ community? Is it for inclusion? Is it for uh, selling more Heineken beer? Um, and why is all this important is because we live in times where the ritual of masking and dance of urgency. So dancing in times of crisis is happening at the same time. And during COVID for me it was really interesting to look how these two rituals appear in the online space. So how the body that is not allowed to move and doesn't have a space will find its way to move uh, and, 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 uh, and perform these crucial rituals of our existence, the ritual of masking and, um, and dancing. So how the dance uh, can be expressed, how pain can be expressed through dance. These are just some of the examples, because for some people this topic is sometimes quite surprising. But this is, for example, revolution in Georgia, where people danced in front of parliament, collective lastesis that took over the streets of Chile and protests and sings against uh, uh, rape and uh, 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 femicide. And this movement became a viral movement as well. And then recently in the uh, Netherlands, you also had actually Unmute, which was a large different crowds moving through the city and protesting. Um, Oh, sorry, and prote I will not play the sound because it's very loud. Protesting for uh, that right to move and practice freedom of movement. And um, so if we understand these, these concepts, I think then we can also understand what's happening in a VR chat, what's happening with the, the development of digital art, the explosion of digital art, and what is important to fight for in these online spaces. So I will use example of, uh, um, of a VR VR chat. Actually, uh, this video I would like to show you. So, for those who do not know, VR chat is an online platform for socializing where people can from uh, anywhere who have technology access these spaces. And for me, it was really interesting to see who has access to these spaces. So for example, uh, in this case, this is a recording of a person who is in a VR chat uh, by Sarmer from another part of the, of the uh, world. Uh, and this person is being interviewed uh, because um, he's actually paralyzed, but through the VR chat, he has access and has a way to socialize and experience this other kind of body. So I would just like to show you the beginning of it. So this is one of the examples where I think what we are trying to create in cities or what we are trying to create in capitals of Europe somehow still doesn't happen. And that's that kind of inclusivity and participation and space uh, where uh, um, um, with an access. So uh, that does happen actually through technology. And um, another example when it comes to the ritual of masking and performing is actually a recent show uh, that is about to start on the Fox television. And then I will stop there and uh, just kind of continue through the discussion further.
Okay, yeah, thank you. Hope I managed to uh, deliver this within the given time. It was a bit tough, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, applause. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I have many, many questions, but we have one more panelist to introduce before we move on to uh, the round table discussion. Uh, so our next artist is also joining us on Zoom. Maybe if we could bring up Emily, uh, Emily Graham on the screen. Hello, nice to see you in person. Um, so Emily Graham uh, is uh, an artist working primarily with color photography uh, based in London in the UK. Uh, her practice often deals with elusive subject matters, a search for the unknown, a psychological state, the act of communication and interpretation. Her first book, The Blindest Man, will be published in Void in 2022. And her newest work, Echo, is currently being shown in the Futures Hybrids exhibition at Melkweg Expo, which you can all see right here where we are sitting. Um, so Emily, please uh, tell us more. Very interested to hear. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me OK? Um, yes. Uh, yes. Um, I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, Okay, great. I think that is working. Um, great. Um, I'm Emily Graham. Um, I'm an artist based in London. I was meant to be with you in person today, um, but COVID restrictions prevent it. So um, I'm in London. Um, thank you so much to Futures and to Marina for inviting me to participate in this discussion and for including my work in the Associated Hybrids exhibition. Um, I'm just going to talk about the two bodies of work briefly that Sarah mentioned, um, The Blindest Man and um, Echo. Um, so my last long-term body of work, The Blindest Man, was based on the real story of an unsolved treasure hunt and is a reflection of the act of searching and what happens when you can't find the answers that you're looking for. I was interested in the notion of the treasure hunt as metaphor and in turn the search as a reflection of the photographic pursuit, so the tensions between the promise of truth and the delivered partiality. And um, it's a, as I said, it's a real story. Um, so, if I can move um, 25 years ago, a gone treasure was buried somewhere in the landscape of France and it is um, yet to be found. A community of people search for the hidden treasure guided by a book of elusive clues released by an anonymous author who is now dead. Um, yeah, hundreds such for uncommitting years of this pursuit, um, stuck in a perpetual cycle of unsolved clues. Um, and in the making of this work, I joined this pursuit, kind of acting as treasure hunter, looking for photographs as I followed hunters' failed searches across France. Um, and, and kind of to situate in the space of this discussion, although the puzzle was designed to be solved within a few years, a community fueled by competition developed around it, an online one. And it's cited as one of the earliest virtual communities. It was born out of pre-internet Minitel in France, where there was a question and answer space for the treasure hunt. And it's within this online community in which rumor, misinformation, and red herring spread, confusing many individual routes of investigation. The treasure hunt as a concept draws on both knowledge and fantasy and gives readings of land and space through different subjective knowledges. And then the literary history of the treasure hunt brings in connotations of adventure, the protagonist, the explorer of accolades of success. I spent time with the hunters and the, inter the interpretations of the hunt vastly vary from the frustrated rationalists to spiritual readings whereby life is imbued with science um, to obsession whereby one one hunter is suing the authors um, because he's so convinced of his um, his own solutions that yield no no results. Though my work doesn't specifically focus on the digital aspect, it certainly plays into it. Um, the searchers all have pseudonyms from the forum, which they carry through to real life meetings. Um, the the pseudonyms were an important part of the world building 
around the hunt, um, a kind of alternative identity, which they've lived with for the past 20 years of, or so of the forum existing, um, and, and which, and they kind of create these self-created narratives in which they're the protagonists in their own adventure story. My work, Echo, which is showing in the hybrid show at the moment, um, also follows a kind of arbitrary trail to make images. I, be I began the work with an interest in technology and how it affects the way in which we see, perceive and relate to the physical world, um, how it mediates um, and the blind faith that we often put in said technology. James Bridle, in his book, New Dark Age, writes about how GPS enables the, the blue dot that folds the entire planet around the individual. And I was interested in this um, idea of an, indiv uh, of an in invisible computational framework that holds the individual at the centre. In the first lockdown, I was looking for a way to make images within my locality and came across Randonautica. It's an app which asks the user to set an intention whilst the app generates random coordinates to give them a destination to adventure to, um, claiming to help users enhance their spirituality, experience my matter interaction phenomena, uh, find enchantment in the world around them. It utilizes probability to co-op meaning. Young people or people film their randonauting adventures um, sometimes following the app over their own judgment. And when teenagers film themselves uh, finding a suitcase with, with human remains in, this became a viral trend um, on TikTok or through TikTok. Um, and, and thus young people exploring the peripheries of their, their localities um, became a trend, looking for ways to be shocked or speak to a charm, looking for experience and looking to correlate expectations with what they find. It also led to many performed or fake videos in order to become more popular. I was, I was interested in this kind of performance of confirmation bias, these layers of journey, subjective experience, performance, narrative, um, documentation and myth-making and the kind of di dissolving boundaries between some uh, accepted binary states. So kind of truth and fiction, documentation, performance, online, offline, reality, fantasy. This, this slide is, um, is a still from the video piece, which I will show you at the end because it requires switching screens. Um, I use the app to generate routes on which to photograph, kind of playing with my own parameters of chance and control, autonomy and automation, and combine my own photographs with the, with the video piece, which shows clips recycled from TikTok um, fragments from user randonautica videos. The clips are presented in a, in a circuit, uh, creating their own relationships to one another and creating a kind of disorientating space of, of looping experiences, but also their own um, kind of visual po poetics. My own photographs are essentially documentary frames, found scenes taken from these randomly generated journeys, um, looking at and through the idea of facades, the city is a kind of set, looking for images that allude to fantasy, to the city as a construction on which to project, project one's own subjectivities. There's, there's a fetishization of the real that occurs in the split between the off, online and the offline um, division. And I wanted to play on that in my uh, photographs and this idea of apprehending reality as potential. In the hybrid display, I was interested in, in how Still, static images can interact with digital moving content. How space and place can come together with expressions of experience. Um, and also bringing together the 
the kind of so-called performed content and found or real images. I'm wondering how we read this, these distinctions or in fact what these distinctions mean and creating an interplay of revealing and concealing to kind of reflect on the ambiguities of a vision. And this dance between revealing and concealing is what's fascinating to me, both in the photographic and as a condition of social media. Um, so this QR code, I don't know how you're seeing it, but this link to the video piece, if you want to see it on your own devices, or I will just bring, try and bring it up and... Sorry, I need to find the other screen. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily, for sharing. Um, that concludes the presentations, uh, the introductions that we had uh, for each artist. So we're going to be moving on to a roundtable discussion. Of course, we neither have a roundtable here, uh, nor do we have everybody present. So it's going to be slightly less uh, natural than, uh, than if everybody was here in person. Uh, so let's all be patient and, uh, and sort of just vibe off of each other as well. Um, for the panelists, uh, please feel free to jump in, um, to bounce ideas off of each other, uh, to respond directly to other panelists, uh, make it as interactive as you like. Uh, there are no set rules specifically. I'll start with some questions and we can just move along our discussion uh, as we all desire to. Um, and for the audience, we will be having uh, our audience Q&A uh, in the last 15 minutes. Um, so there's about and just over half an hour, about 35 minutes of this panel. So feel free to take notes and, uh, and, and jot down what you uh, want, really want to uh, answer of burning questions. Uh, and we'll have time for that at the end. Uh, I'm very excited for it. Um, so basically, what I've been noticing from everybody's presentations um, is that there seems to be an urgency with these questions of how we are representing ourselves and how people are being represented in digital space, and the urgency is becoming um, changed in the last two years, I guess, and we can all guess what that is, uh, what that is about. Um, so my question really uh, relates for each artist here joining us. Uh, can you elaborate on these tensions that are created when we are translating our physical bodies into digital space or when we're translating the bodies of others into digital space and digital media. Um, how are these digital bodies represented in your work and what you see in the digital world, specifically in the changed context that is brought with COVID-19 and the, the lockdowns, how um, having this digital space become a part of our everyday lived reality in our domestic space, um, how it changes that kind of tension um, that we represent ourselves with. Uh, perhaps we can go around in a circle. Maybe we can start uh, with Jan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah perfect. Um, I was initially thinking of like uh, identity is contextual, so um, it depends on the context of the space one is in. And so in my work specifically, it's about the art context and how players have to behave in an art field or in an art context, which is also kind of like a game, just like finance, no? or just like a casino. So it's, there's a certain kind of like protocol of behavior. And also this protocol of behavior also exists in online spaces like whatever, 4chan, um, 
Minecraft, yeah? Every kind of game space uh, has its own kind of set of behavior, you know? So I was thinking that the, the digitization or the, the mediatization of the body um, changes with the space, like the, the meaning of, of things. And then it also can be combined, of course, you know? What happens if there's an art institution in a game space? What happens if what happens with the players in that field? How do they behave? What does it mean for the production in that space? So, um, yeah, that's what I thought about, no? Yeah, the question of space is, is, <clears throat> is really interesting to me because uh, specifically in this uh, COVID-19 moment that we're uh, existing in for a very long time now, uh, certain platforms and certain spaces have grown a lot more because of the pandemic context. And maybe I want to pose this question to Emily now um, because her work deals with the, the platform TikTok, which really basically exploded at the beginning of the pandemic and has since gained in popularity. Um, what it means for Emily, <laughs> hello, um, to be working with this specific medium uh, in the pandemic context, uh, in this context. Hi, sorry, I'm just <laughs> delay in taking off mute. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I'm I'm working with TikTok, but there's also, I think, for me, the you know, the pandemic was also my reason for making this work, um, both in terms of my own photographs and in terms of the, the kind of appropriated content, the, the video work. Um, the, the limitations um, that were put upon my own body as a photographer um, from the pandemic meant that I kind of looked at my locality in, in a new way um, and looked at the online space uh, in a new way and looked at kind of how people uh, were equally kind of responding to the fact that they had limitations placed upon their body um, by the pandemic and their movement and such. And, and as such, were looking at their own surroundings um, with, with new eyes. And, and then thus that was becoming performed and played out and multiplied online. Um, and, I, and, and I found that really interesting. And, and that's the kind of also the, the explicitness of the performance division um, in those spaces uh, is really interesting to me. I, I guess less about the body, but, but more about the, the kind of the narration of self um, and the explicitness of within that space. Definitely. I think that the spaces in general have changed so much in our physical world. It's interesting to see how that translates into the digital world. And um, relating to what Bogomir has shown us, I'm interested to know um, how this sort of group experience has changed uh, between the physical and digital space in your work, um, going from having these clubbing events um, where you're able to photograph everyone from a bird's eye view to the point where we're all very fragmented, fragmented in our own domestic spaces. How does that, do you see a difference between the group experience uh, in the online, in the digital space, um, now that everyone is fragmented, or uh, do you find it's more of like a liberatory experience of being able to gather in online space? Is there something happening there? Yeah, I think it was it was interesting during the the first lockdowns. I think technology kind of helped us to have that collective uh, experience, uh, but at the same time, it's clear that it's not enough and it's not sufficient, and it still does affect us. Uh, we still do feel lonely. Uh, a lot of us had the burnouts, even with uh, very little stress. So it 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 did no matter how how much it was there as an option it wasn't sufficient and what it did it brought back an explosion of illegal raves 
self-organized events um, and kind of do-it-yourself uh, uh, collective gatherings. Um, and I think this is very interesting because it comes, it becomes, it shows actually the kind of limit of, of a human uh, body. And even those that feel like they don't need to socialize eventually felt that actually they do meet uh, those in between spaces of participation. Um, so another thing is that even the explosion of TikTok, this idea that we perform our dance for the others, and that way we actually gain something, this pleasure of watching others dancing on a little screen, uh, was for me also very interesting because it confirms that um, you know you move not necessarily just by performing the dance but even by watching people in movement um, and um, but when we talk about online environments, it's these house rules and the, the values that these spaces have, or the gesture of hospitality, or who is uh, who is stepping in or doesn't. It's 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 something that was anyway a, a topic and pressure on art institutions and uh, um, um, and physical spaces. So I kind of have feel that this. These two do work well with each other, but not necessarily work on their own. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, another thing is that we always speak about this real and unreal online and offline. I joined few few experiments in a VR chat. And if you ask me about those memories, I don't really feel them uh, as something that didn't happen in a real space. My body memorizes as a real event, as a real, uh, um, uh, almost like a dreamlike uh, sequence, as a real conversation. Um, and that's something that before COVID, I, I actually didn't really um, know, I didn't really experience. So, so um, also different way of understanding the technology and relationships uh, are definitely changed for me. Um, and um, yeah, so, so, so anyway, I don't think, I don't think, I think as a somebody who knows the world before COVID and after, it's much stranger. I think it's a younger generation to kind of really address if this, this online participation uh, really works and in what way it does. Uh, because I think I will always compare things to, you know, like, yeah, memories and, and, and time that uh, I know before and after, yeah. Yeah, it really is a new reality uh, that I'm not sure will ever be back to normal as they've been promising us. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm very interested in that kind of um, like person to person contact aspect of it. And I know, Ugo, you were doing a lot of work based on dating apps. And I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about um, how the body works in that when it when it is such a threat, um, when when we have a, a, a you know a, a virus out there that's spreading through bodily contact. Um, how does uh, doing something like online dating, where the expectation would be to eventually meet in person, how is that bodily threat? represented through how you are interacting and representing yourself and, and showing um, the, you know, your body in digital space, basically. Yeah, like, um, I think, first of all, I think we perform uh, in the real world every day, our body, by the way we look, by the way we dress. So, um, and I think in the digital world, it's even more I think we can perform kind of whatever we want because we don't have a direct connection with the person. There is like two person and then there is a platform which is a digital platform and we meet there. So we can even have more performativity of our body, our mind, we can even create someone, we can create another person, we can have a double in the digital world and I know a lot of people do that because it's also, I was saying in the beginning, a way to escape and a way to have a bit of freedom in this in this world. But regarding the the, the COVID period, it was a bit uh, strange because um, obviously a lot of people went to this digital platform, but in the same time there was the impossibility to meet. So you were 
meeting a lot of people in this platform because it was at that time like full of people because everyone was home basically so a lot of people were going there but in the same time you couldn't meet them in real life so it actually give even more uh, context to this digital platform because it was only digital we couldn't go further usually you use this platform to meet to talk to experience and then in order to meet them physically or in the real life and at that time you couldn't so it was it was kind of a a, a strange period i guess for this platform but in the same time it was also very active um but yeah, I think this, this question about performance in digital platform is so interesting. We can perform whatever we want and sometimes can be a bit scary also. That's why I always say that there is really a strange tension in this platform. It's a place of a space of experimentation, of freedom, but also a place of fear. So there is a lot of tension in this platform that are really love to explore and that change through the, the 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 period and also with the the covid yeah yeah definitely it, it sounds kind of like the digital world or just the digital in general has uh gained a lot of power almost yeah. uh through this pandemic and through our isolation and and increased reliance on uh the digital object basically the digital world um so one thing that I'm really wondering is when does that power overwhelm? And I think that relates to your work orally a lot um, in the sense that, you know, this, this digital space, the, the expectation to perform digitally can really like uh, overcome ourselves and it can, it can kind of um, lead to a lot of mental health issues and, and mental health uh, difficulties. Do you think you could um, explore a little bit more the, the, um, what you're representing as far as mental health uh, ramifications in this time, perhaps, if you're open to it? I don't know if I'm a mental health uh, talker or whatever, uh, but I just think, yeah, the internet is a bit like, um, it's a, a magnificent place because you have so much possibility and so much things that you can do. You can really like have so much knowledge, talk with whoever you want, and like really be connected to people all over the world. And everything is just super easy to reach. But I think it's also creating divide and this idea that yeah, you're all together, but you're not really together in a way like you're, um, you can be in a dinner or something and then everybody's on the phone and they're all talking to someone else because, um, I don't know, they want to be with this person or something. And it's also this idea that if you're not on the phone, then you're also nobody in the same time or something. So it's, it's, it's a great place, but it's also like, yeah, creating a lot of divide and like the connection between people is not really like... Um, happening anymore and, and I feel um, yeah I don't know. <laughs> I, it, and I think it's uh, very detrimental also in this kind of mental health issue because yeah everybody feel more lonely and you you as you cannot connect with people how are you gonna feel good for yourself and it's all about this like loneliness and um, yeah I don't know things like this yeah it's very interesting to think about how isolation affects people differently in the way um, that they move their bodies in, di in the digital space that we're not now all sort of forced to be within. Um, and I think one of the ways that a, a lot of you have brought up have been um, this sort of tension between overrepresenting yourself and also concealing yourself. Um, so the hiding and showing and commodifying yourself, but then also protecting yourself. And I'm wondering if anyone would like to jump in um, to talk a little bit more about that tension between, you know, hiding behind an avatar or hiding behind a screen name uh, and, and perhaps maybe why there might be some importance to that process of hiding. Actually, I mean, sure, we could go to the digital, uh, but we could also remain in uh, our bodily kind of um, presence. And when I think of different social classes, they all have markers that can also be co-opted by people who want to fit in. And when I think of that, it's actually a mediatized kind of body in itself. 
for example, like in Silicon Valley, like people are really obsessed with Patagonia, which is not specifically super expensive. I mean, it is kind of it is expensive, but it's not like you don't need to be a millionaire to afford Patagonia. So, um, which makes it kind of like a potential for super rich people to fit in with other social classes and be like totally camouflaged. So, um, and um, so Patagonia is something one can use for that. Or also like the absence of carry bags. So super rich people don't carry their own stuff. So that's also a way how to kind of spot super rich people. So that's also kind of like a very pervasive um, mechanism that is also close to be an avatar, no? To just uh, through uh, signifiers of class. So that's what I thought of, especially in relation to what Bogomir said about um, how to how to mask oneself in a mass. No? That's what you said in your introduction, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, you're, oh, sorry. I, I thought that I'm somewhere in a different direction. Yeah. Yes. I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting to think again if we talk about clubs or music festivals or dancing places. It's exactly because. Uh, the social status can be turned upside down, you know, like, a, a, um, I don't know, like a, a working class person could become the best dancer on the dance floor, and vice versa. And, um, and actually, you kind of have, you receive the status through performing the dance. Um, but I was also, uh, about the, the previous question, I also started thinking about... Um, this is something interesting that happened in Berlin, and that's like uh, the kind of a reclaiming of public space. Because I think before COVID, we really had space. You know, we are uh, always saying how Western Europe is extremely free and everybody can do whatever they want, la la la. But it's always within these hours that are given to us for that. So we can go to sex club on weekend as long as we are back on Monday at work. We can go crazily high and, you know, like uh, out play, practice outer state of consciousness as long as we are back at work on Monday morning. To have spaces for certain things. And I think what happened with COVID, the spaces got locked, and then suddenly the public space became the space, and also online space became a little bit of a public space. Um, and um, so this kind of reclaiming of a public space and taking over streets and taking over parks uh, became very, uh, very interesting as a place for practicing this ritual of togetherness. So what, what happened in Berlin, I was there in August and we end up in a night in a park uh, because a friend of mine thought that I would love to see how gay cruising culture uh, became a cruising culture for teenagers and for all kinds of people. But the cruising is not for sexual pleasure. The cruising is for a base. It's for this kind of a, a carry-on technology uh, where people actually look for base and for the music experience just by uh, listening and, you know, kind of getting lost in the dark in a park. So the gay cruising culture totally kind of almost mutated um, and um, and it became uh, yeah it became this vehicle of uh, healing together practicing new togetherness being together um, etc so I'm just thinking if if there is such an example in an online environment where uh, that collective healing is really possible um, uh, through the participation so it, I did not find it uh, um, and I don't know if others did but uh, yeah I still don't know uh, I can't bring any online experience on that level strong enough yet It's very interesting because I think that the digital space has been sort of from the beginning marketed as this kind of pristine space where you can create whatever you want. And then also you get to a point where, as you were mentioning before, Jan, you're able to conceal parts of your identity that might have privilege, that might have control over others and make it more easy to um, 
put forward that control and to marginalize others and to move in the shadows it sounds very uh, Disney villain, but um, I think that that sort of messiness is, is hidden uh, under this sort of expectation of aesthetic beauty. And I'm wondering maybe, um, I'm personally thinking of the work of Orly as well as of Emily that are very focused on this sort of tactile uh, location based in, in Emily's case the the mapping um, and and what you mentioned about the finding a suitcase with the a, a, a dead body in it um, this kind of like disturbance of that uh, beautiful pristine reality could you elaborate a little bit about um, how that might be important or necessary uh, to show some sort of authenticity or reality of, of human bodily experience itself um, I think it's important because um, in the internet there is uh, really this idea that you have to show your best self or um, yeah, everything that is, looks good and everything that has to look interesting and uh, also for example in fashion and where the aesthetic is very important but um, it feels a bit fake sometimes and it feels like there is this necessity to come back to uh, real life or something that is more um, real and it, I think this like those are things that happen. I mean, this is clearly not fun. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's important to show a bit danger of it and to show that um, the internet can also be a very dangerous place because you're also displaying yourself there and you're having your whole body and your face and everything and everybody can do what they wish with uh, what they see. They can create their own narrative around uh, your face and around your action and they can create anything. So it's also yeah, important to show that um, yeah, this is very shiny, this is very beautiful, but this is also a bit uh, dangerous and there is some kind of like um, darker theme to it or something. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very interesting, especially also considering the sort of danger of the outside world as well as represented digitally. And I'm wondering, Emily, if you can elaborate on that kind of mapping as not only like a, a playful experience, but also as something that has a darker side to it as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I, and I, I, you know, when I started kind of going through Randonautica um, content, it, I found it kind of really fascinating because there's a kind of the, the almost the duality of the online and offline spaces, or, or the separation of these spaces, almost kind of created a objectification of. of an idea of the real or an idea of the real world, like a fetishization. Um, and, and I was thinking about uh, in, in like traditions of street photography and how we are used to dealing with photographs of, or, or image content of, of the real world and how in this kind of gamification, I suppose, for want of a better word, um, through, you know, Randonautica app or, you know, lots of other similar apps. I suppose there are things like Pokemon Go that did a similar type of thing before this. Um, but, um, yeah, there, there's a, a kind of taking of the real world or content in the real world and looking for what is um, shocking or disturbing or and, and kind of seeking that out for one's own content which um, I suppose is the other is the other side to it um, certainly within the Randonautica community there's this kind of uh, I suppose they're seeking out of the more extreme experiences or interactions with the kind of real world um, and and that's such as when the um, teenagers found the body in the in the suitcase there was then a whole kind of hashtag trend of don't go random auditing and people would embed it in their videos but that almost becomes like a, a, a call to to people to do it more um, and, and that tension is is really interesting yeah definitely oh go ahead oh yeah no, no yeah. I was just thinking about how avatars are actually marketized on Instagram and how the gig community especially forces like cultural practitioners to um, to present a certain image of themselves in order to cash in on that, um, which is 
because you just said it's a kind of gamified system, it's actually a callous gamification of um, of capital, I guess, capital labor relation, basically, on Instagram that we perform, uh, all of us kind of, I guess, perform, no? Yeah. Everybody does. And it's not fun, yeah. but still it's gamified, but it's not fun. Yeah, when that, uh, when that gets re-represented back into the physical world, when something like, when we take things like avatars and digital culture and come into the physical world and start representing it, do you, do you feel like that's also a sort of commodification in that sense of what it means to be, like that, that sort of translation? Which 100%. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really that neoliberal, um, how's this, how's, what's the word, subsumption? Is that a word? It kind of be. like, yeah. like the, like, private life cannot be distinguished from um, online life, again, because being online is invisible, right? Like, we don't really notice when we go online. We're not dialing in to a modem and pay, like, I don't know, how much was it back then? A couple of cents per minute, no? Maybe, no? <laughs> I, I don't remember. But it's, it's not a conscious process, but instead we're constantly online and we're constantly... Um, marketing ourselves to some kind of invisible um, workplace, I guess. Like, Instagram is kind of the employer, <laughs> and we're, help we're, I mean, we're offering our labor all the time when we help to improve the algorithm with each capture we do. So it's really, it is a callous gamification, yeah. That's a very good phrase, I think, <laughs> callous gamification. <laughs> And I'm wondering, like, this process um, where we're basically selling ourselves, uh, when it comes through with a physical product, like, I mean, I hate to refer to humans as products, but when it comes to online dating, it really does feel like selling yourself on the app as well. Um, and I'm wondering, because, Ugo, your work showed this building of tension in the video throughout. I'm wondering what the, the end result is. Does it, I feel like it collapses into disappointment. Do you know what I mean? Like when you, when you see someone in real life, this fantasy has been built, and then you, you, you meet them, and it, this is not the digital fantasy that I expected. You know what I mean? Can yeah, you elaborate yeah. that on a, a bit? Yeah, yeah, sure, because, um, yeah, I th as I said, we really perform uh, someone. It can be also someone very different online. And like, for example, if you're going to, to, to gay app, for example, you don't see a lot of faces. Some, a lot of people don't want to be seen in this application, also because maybe it's a space of danger for them, mm -hmm. because their community don't know maybe that they are gay, the family, so it can also be dangerous for them. So a lot of images are actually only body. So you open the app and you see bodies everywhere, and you are like a kind of body market, I don't know, it's very weird. And you see three, four faces, so you kind of connect with an identity with someone, but at the same time, it's a digital platform. So there is like many uh, steps before identifying someone or before talking with someone. And yeah, I think there is, there is a, a really disconnection with that. And it, it can become a place of danger as well. And I also heard so many bad stories on this application. You know, some people just go there and pretend they are homosexual and pretend they want to meet you. And then you meet them in real life and then bad things happen. So, and it's becoming more and more the case. I know like three, three months ago in Brussels it happened and someone died. So it's also very problematic, very problematic, and a lot of people now going in this application, they don't want to show their faces as well. So yeah, it's becoming a bit dangerous as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a dangerous element when you yeah. uh, cross over from online to offline. I mean, not always, of course, but uh, there is a risk, of course. And I think that, you know, we think about the digital space as being somewhere that's safe because it isn't our physical space. No one can physically harm us. But then maybe a question just to pose to everybody is, 
what is the harm of moving our physical selves into digital space? Where does it become dangerous in that sense when we're staying just online? How does that dangerous element appear? I think when, um, when you put too much your private life in the digital space, it can become dangerous. I, I always like think that it's not so good to put a lot of our private life in the digital space because, and you also see that with stories, like we put a lot of private things, like what we are doing, what we are eating, and it can be dangerous because people can follow you, they don't even know you, but they know at 9 p.m. where you are, what you are doing, with who you are, mm -hmm. and this is scary for me. I don't want to know that like someone that I don't know can see that I'm with this person partying somewhere, eating this and that, and this is dangerous for me. Yeah. yeah. There was a story of a, a woman uh, like uh, who got killed just because she was posting a uh, selfie and then the person knew where she lived and then, yeah. Yeah, and that can really show the, the danger of having your image yeah. and your location yeah. from that image being shown. Does anybody else have any... Uh, Oh, yeah, ideas on the topic, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the physical ramification of what could go wrong on the internet, but I was rather thinking about how, for example, um, especially Discord, because in opposite to Facebook, which has this clear name uh, policy, I think, you have to put in your real name in order to use Facebook, and then they also want your number and whatever, but on Discord, everyone can just be their avatar, you know, that has no... Um, I mean, I guess there are ways to trace back who that person is, but on Discord, people are just avatars, no? And I was thinking about how Discord especially, because you can just, there's no algorithm that tells you what channel to, uh, what server to enter or what, um, what community to join, but you can just um, get lost in this kind of digital echo chamber, and then um, something can happen which is like the the digital radicalization right you only join the channels that share your kind of ideology or whatever be it like right wing or sure. um, or super toxic no and then it's this dangerous subject formation that can really happen where you're like uh, being exposed to I don't know uh, right wing visuals and at some point you're just like the, you started as a troll, and then all of a sudden you're like full-fledged Nazi, yeah. <laughs> like in Fortune or wherever. No, yeah. just exactly. Yeah. 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 So I think we're about to move into our Q and A section. We have about one minute um, before we do that. So everybody, get your questions ready. Oh, it's such lovely faces behind me. Um, so I just want to give maybe about ten seconds to each artist to just say um, one thing that they think the audience should perhaps uh, take away from this panel discussion or what they think uh, might be the most important message from you personally. Uh, I know this is very on the spot, but shall we go around in a circle again? Get out of the internet. <laughs> Get off the internet, okay, sure. Yeah, just like uh, think about uh, how you perform yourself in your everyday life and also in the internet, yeah performance and performativity. Perfect. Anybody from Zoom, our hybrid guests? Uh, I, think, I think maybe just to add to the performance um, point, just kind of, uh, I think what is also interesting to me is the distinctions between kind of performance and reality, um, well, kind of real and fake, and um, how much those distinctions matter, uh, or how much those distinctions are dissolving and then kind of what larger impact that has on how we read kind of content going forward. Perfect. Bogomir, did you have any thoughts yourself? I'm still thinking because I, I, I don't, um, I feel like you now the discussion about online kind of when this is like the more of a dangerous space. Um, and I actually think it's a space with a lot of potential, and well, not a lot of potential, it's a space that works in so many different ways. I mean, dating apps are interesting, and I think they definitely affect the way we speak and the way how we have sex, and I think also 
uh, in the same way porn did and uh, where we, you know, we take more drugs and the camp sex and crystal meth became a very necessary a spice to the having sex in a gay community because you want to perform that masculinity that you don't necessarily have always. So, um, but for me, I, like, I have to actually uh, go a little bit back because I said that the, the online experiences I had were not close to that experience that I had in the club or in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the cruising area. And that's true, but at the same time, I do remember the moment where during the lockdown I met a friend in the VR chat and we actually almost, we did not physically touch each other, but just by actually playing with those different bodies uh, something happened in the sense uh, uh, that we actually work together in space. And I think how the technology will develop and evolve, this will improve. Uh, what's for me important is that uh, we really take care how our public spaces and cities and countries and governments develop so that we don't end up that the only option for experimentation and playfulness and togetherness becomes an online space. So that kind of constant fight, because I think we tend to take things for granted, you know, like gay rights, great, now I don't have to do anything anymore. Uh, so I think we really need to constantly fight and negotiate uh, equally online space and public space uh, in, in the cities or wherever we are. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. And Jan, your final remarks very quickly. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Emily. Like, it's... Um important to distinguish between or the distinction is increasingly harder to make between performance and and real and also um, something that is known under the term of irony poisoning I mean you can be ironic on the internet and you can be all uh, like ironic all you want but at some point it becomes really hard to distinguish what you really mean and what you really believe in Understood. and uh, that is difficult so irony and trolling is passe. That's what I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. OK, we're going to open it up for the audience to uh, ask some questions. Hello, everyone. It's nice for me to be able to turn around, finally. Um, we have some runners with microphones, I believe, hiding somewhere in the wings. Oh, hello. Yes, over there. Um, so if anybody has a question already, um, I have some lights in my eyes, but I think we'll find you. Um, feel free to raise your hand. Yes, we have a microphone coming for you. Okay, I'll try to phrase the question as best as I can, but I just thought it was really interesting how you talked about public space and private space, especially in regarding to the internet, because if you think of the internet as a public space, I would just wonder because even though everybody has access to it and everyone can publish whatever they want, there's always some kind of editor. There's always someone who has the right, even if, I, if it's my space, I become the editor of that space. So there's never really any public space. There's never, never a space where absolutely everybody can do whatever they want. And I mean, in, in real life, there, there is some, it, there is space for that. I mean, like you can, go on and like, put up a poster wherever you want, I guess, but somebody will come and take it down. And also in regarding to extremism, which we briefly got into, like how, how to deal, okay, this question is harder to phrase, but I just, I thought about it also with the idea of like being anonymous and like what it is to be anonymous online compared to what it is being anonymous um, uh, in real life and like how those two things are really different um, and just maybe that's not really a question, but like how, as like participant, as we are all participants online, like how do you deal with public space there, and like how do you deal with extremism that is like growing online? Yeah, I guess that's that. Or if you have thoughts around it, yeah, it was really interesting to listen to. Yeah, Would anyone like to jump in uh, for that question? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could. I, I have a feeling I brought this idea of uh, public space and online space as a public space. I mean, I think with, with you know, as, as a Serbian migrant, uh, so not EU, um, I learned a long time ago that privacy is a luxury for uh, Westerners. <laughs> you know, like a kind of this uh, 
all this topic about privacy and anonymity and invisibility became uh, hot only when Westerners be, uh, understood that they're losing, uh, they actually don't have the privacy. You know, for me to come to Netherlands to study, I had to show the papers about my family, about earnings of my mom at that time, about all my history in order just to enter that public space that is called European Union. So, um, and now with COVID, I think it's also interesting to understand how our bodies are not ours, but they're governmental. If the government says that we all stay at home, we all stay at home. If the government says shoot those that don't go stay home, we will be shot. So the idea of like a public space, it's again one of these kind of luxurious concepts that um, we can discuss uh, in times of um, comfort and prosperity. I mean, um, so for me, you know, the, the, uh, there's always editor and there's always uh, uh, an entrance ticket to something. Yeah. Um, I do agree that, you know, some places, some countries are more comfortable, comfortable than others and you have like a different regulations. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think originally the idea of internet was that it's a public space where we can uh, do a lot of different things and meet and exchange and publish and share. Um, and then the fans got tighter and tighter. Um, so it's more, it's, I don't really believe that there is like a really free public space uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, um, and at the same time, I don't believe that it's possible online as well. But it's, yeah, it's more about how we find those spaces where we practice uh, uh, certain things and where we, where we, through this kind of artistic researches and practices, uh, uh, receive something or, or, or a certain kind of knowledge and experience that can be helpful to us further, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm a pessimist, but I just really, I really think that we are all edited <laughs> uh, from the day we we're born. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I feel like this might be a question that's more so freedom versus surveillance, or even if it is a versus situation, I think that uh, people see their private lives as being something within their control, but then in reality, uh, everything is tied to different systems of oppression and surveillance and control, uh, even in our bedrooms, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, that's why we need good laws, um, yeah. and that's, that's what makes us... Um, that's the difference between the, between the countries. And so we need good laws, and I think we also need to really participate in the way how... Uh, technology is developed, how it's used. That's what I meant with the, so, with the constant fight. I think it's really, it, it, it's, it's impossible to, um, to just believe that things are in hands of a good people and right people. So um, I guess that's why we do what we do because we see that things are a little bit uh, not right. So we try to kind of through the work, uh, participate in reparation or fixing of it, yeah. Definitely. Perhaps should we take another audience question? Does anybody have something burning on their mind? It can be also directed to one panelist specifically or in general as well. Oh, we have someone, yeah. yes. I think we have a microphone running over to you now. Well, a, a person with a microphone, not just a microphone. Hello everyone. Uh, sorry, I feel uh, like a, a paradox here. We as artists or as a photographer, we are going to collect uh, a personal moment of people's life. And sometimes we asking permission or without permission, we are doing that. This means we are doing the same thing that social media are doing in a, uh, we are doing in a real life, they are doing in a virtual life. The problem, we think that, okay, we have right to do that. But when we are going to the other side, we're saying, oh, we, it's danger, you know, they have. Are you feel the same? This is the question. Are you feel this paradox is uh, uh, it's, uh, logic? Are we have right to collect that moment with permission or without permission? Or, you know, we didn't use or we don't use that moment that we captured against anybody. Or till now, we didn't saw 
any social media to use it against us. Uh, what do you think about this paradox? Great question. Yes, go ahead. Um, I think it's also uh, the way you work uh, and it's um, the way you photograph people. I know, for example, myself, I always uh, have the permission to photograph people. I communicate with them. Uh, we create an image together and I'm not photographing someone if he doesn't want to. And for me, this is very important. Uh, and it's just the way uh, we work. And I think it's very important when I see like street photographers, for example, who are basically walking and then take you, taking picture of you and you see them and you're like, why are you taking picture of me? Why is going to be published this image? And this is very problematic. Uh, but I think we have more and more conscious about this and it's important to be aware of that and deal with your model or the person you photograph in order to make an agreement. Um, and especially for my work that deals with LGBTQ community, I'm very careful about that. Also when a photograph is published somewhere, I also ask my models, are you okay if this photograph is going to this newspaper or whatever? Because it's important, there's a question of respect and I think we don't have to forget about this yet. I'm also wondering on this on the same topic, thank you for bringing it up, I'm wondering um, when you think about how photog photographs move in the digital space, um, it can often go so much more quickly than in the physical world. So when we're talking about like, does this person give their consent to have their image moved throughout digital space, um, I think about things like memes where it's a lot of very different people um, some of whom who are in positions of power and some of whom are just, you know, somebody on 4chan or, or in their basement, you know, making a funny meme. Uh, I'm wondering where do we draw this line um, where, where, you know, memes can be dangerous but also be um, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's a new... How do we deal with the new world of memes is basically going to be the last question <laughs> that we have. Yes. Oh, no. Okay. So that's the last thing that I want you all to think about when you leave because we're now at the end of our uh, panel discussion. Uh, we're out of time and I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here, all of the artists who've joined me at the table and over Zoom. And I also want to say thanks to the audience, those who ask questions and those who have perhaps uh, will be going away with a little bit more to think about when it comes to uh, the internet, digital space, your bodies, the world, all of these big questions. Um, I'd like to ask maybe for a round of applause for everyone. Yay. And I think that uh, Marina has some information to share, so I'll hand it back over to Marina. Yeah, I just want to thank you all. Thank you, Bogumir, Emily, Ugo, Aurelie, Jan and Emily, uh, and <laughs> Sarah, sorry, for this uh, amazing and interesting conversation. Of course, we always need more time. I think we can continue for one more hour, but thanks for sharing your thoughts. And uh, now we'll have a 15 minute break uh, before second panel. Uh, I'm, inviting, uh, you, I'm wanting you all to join us. And I would like to mention then in Café Space of Melchweg, you will be able to see performance of Jean-Vincent Simonet, who is also artist exhibiting in hybrid show. So you will be able to see the process and his mechanical paintings today, all day and tomorrow. And in the room next to the café is our exhibition, hybrid, so please come and see. See you in uh, 15 minutes. Thanks.